we were talking about this, this idea of, of jam in the third room, and what we're talking about is uh, me and Ewan playing in the studio downstairs, but actually playing with Gareth in real time, who was in London at the Royal College of Music. So we're using a system called Lola that Paul's going to talk to you about much more later, but really what we're talking to, about today is not the kind of science of it, not how all the tech works necessarily, but actually talking as musicians and producer and engineer about how it felt to do this. So we're much more interested in the experience rather than the, the kind of nuts and bolts and ones and zeros of the whole sort of thing. So I'm going to tell you a wee bit about the tech there. Uh, in the picture that you just saw there, a lot of you know that Romney and other studio there, and we can see Gareth just there onto the window of the of the drum booth there. And we've tried to do it so that he was life size, uh, and kind of felt for these guys as though he was actually in the studio there. So it's it's meant to be a live session. It's a studio session there. So how are we able to do this, and in what way is this different? I'm sure if I said how many people here use Skype. How many people use FaceTime? That just about every hand in the room is going to go up. Anyone ever tried doing a collaborative kind of thing, trying to play to someone, even sing with someone over Skype? It just falls apart, doesn't it? It just doesn't work because we've got a lag. There's maybe something like half a second between you speaking and the person at the other end hearing what you're saying there. So if you try and sing, you can kind of follow them, but then they hear you half a second later, later and they fall apart. We just can't do it. So that was the problem that was described to a bunch of, of network engineers in Italy, in, in a place called Tartini, by the conservatory in, in, in Tartini there. The, the musicians there said, well, what's, what's going on here? Even if I'm stood next to someone, if we were just trying to Skype each other, Gareth and I just, just next to each other there, we'd still have this huge uh, lag between us. It can't be about the distance. And the network engineers said, that's a good point. Don't know, we'll look at it. And they said, well, look, can you get it so that we can get the latency low enough so that we can actually play together at the same time? And they said, well, probably not, but we'll have a look at it. We'll find out what the problem is. So they started to look at it, and they, they discovered that it, the problem was actually everything. The problem was the cameras. The problem was sound. But also the problem was anything like Skype or FaceTime, it doesn't know what kind of internet connection you've got. You might have a fast connection sometimes. We all know this. How many times do you go, kind of, oh, the internet's really slow today, Kevin Bacon with his buffer face kind of thing like that. <laughs> we get these kind of huge delays, don't we? And, you know, I can be Skyping someone thinking this is a really good connection, then all of a sudden it slows down, and I'm going, right, we now know it's Renee uh, downloading box sets. Of, of <laughs> time. Or it's my dog on eBay looking for doggy treats. <laughs> I'm joking, she's got her own Amazon account. <laughs> And all of a sudden things kind of grind to, to a halt and, and we, just can't, we just can't use the thing anymore then. And so they, they, these guys are network engineers and they know, well actually, if we get a really fast connection, we can rule that out. So they said, right, let's use the kind of connection that goes between universities. So uh, we put Gareth down in the Royal College of Music and obviously we were down here in the studio here at, at, at Napier. So we knew we had a great connection there. So uh, the other thing is we mentioned was, was cameras. So they said, well look, we must be able to get camera technology that's fast enough. And they said, well, think about robots. A camera on a robot, my impression is a camera on a robot. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be really fast. Otherwise, the robot is looking, you know, it, it thinks he's looking over there and it's actually half a second further on there. So they eventually managed to work out a system whereby they could use incredibly fast cameras, very fast network connections, and they could put together a system called LOLA. And LOLA stands for low latency. It's as simple as that. Cool tank. Yeah. So low latency, literally as it says there, means that we can hear Gareth really only affected by the distance. And down to London we were getting something round about 10 milliseconds. Now to put that into perspective, sound travels about, about a foot a millisecond. So if we go about 10 feet apart, something like that, and we were playing together, then, then we'd already have that kind of latency. So it's no different, really, to the sort of latency we would feel on stage. So in principle, that kind of, you know, if the three of us were on a big stage and playing like that, what we were experiencing here would be pretty similar there. So Lola is showing us that actually the tech makes it possible for, for us to do this. We can get the time down sufficiently. But then all kinds of other things come into it. It's just what about visual image, all those kind of things. And those are the sort of things that we're going to describe. But at the moment, 
suffice to say that given a fast enough connection, we can actually play pretty much in real time. So that's Absolutely. the experiment. So what we're going to do is we're going to just have a really quick listen to some of the music that we were making. We are going to talk more about the experience of it, but we had three, four, three tunes. Yeah, we had three tunes that we were working on on the day. We're just going to hear kind of a wee snippet of some of these. So what you're seeing here is the, the, the life of the Garrett Orchestra. somewhere in the middle. It was kind of expressive music that we were using to kind of really test the system and listen to it and we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that as we go through. So this is the one thing, what's the catch <laughs> is one of the questions, wasn't there? That's the thing, isn't it? There's, there's got to be some kind of trade-off there and you heard it. So if you're listening carefully to that, do you hear the odd glitch, the odd click, the odd kind of dropout? No, you know, I mean, we're all used to that. We're watching something on YouTube and we hear it kind of it break up or we're listening to something online, we're streaming something and we hear it there. So that's the catch. If we're using a very fast connection, then we need to remove all kind of, of recovery and, and buffering and all those kind of things like that. So, so effectively, if we get a dropout in, in, the, in the audio there, we can't do anything about it. These guys just have to have to continue with that. And that's something that I'll, I'll talk about in a bit. Okay, so again, it was a study, so we're going to talk about what the, the method was. We were, we were kind of dealing with a, a method, <coughs> an approach to the research mm. that we'd call collaborative, collaborative autoethnography. And we were using what Chang in 2013 described as concurrent collaboration model. And really what that meant was the three of us were working together, each of us were involved in the session and we were taking notes and we were kind of recording it and videoing it so we had all this, all this kind of information about what was actually going on. And what we did is we all had our own perspectives, we all had our own understandings of what was happening, but this idea of it being concurrent collaboration was that we took that and we all came together and worked together to have a shared understanding of what the session was and what it meant to actually be a musician working in that, that setting or producing indeed. So, over to Gareth, who's going to talk to you, we're going to give these three perspectives. Gareth's going to talk to you about his perspective as a drummer, myself as the saxophone player and the composer, and then Paul as the producer. So over to you first, Gareth. Okay. Um, it, was, it was fun. Um, I, had, I had a really stressful morning uh, teaching. It was, teaching was fine, but it was a lot of, the day felt like a lot of effort. So I, I went across town from uh, Kilburn to, uh, to South Kensington, which took me a bit of an hour. Um, and so it was nice to kind of arrive in the recording studio and have a nice wooden space and some drums and everything. They were great, and the, and the cymbal sounded lovely, and that was very nice and kind of calm. So I, was, I felt ready for the for the music, but I was deeply suspicious that it might not work um, because you know having done Skype things many times, they're just a bit rubbish. Someone I heard someone say the other day that um, you can't ever argue on Skype because you don't you don't have the, not the timing doesn't work, so you just have to kind of be really polite. You know, and, um, I didn't want to argue with the guys, but it was I was expecting that kind of. You know, sort of politeness and, you know, I'll say my piece, wait. Okay, and then you wait for the response, you know, that kind of thing. So, I think, even though it was low latency, it's got latency in the temple, so I was expecting, I think, some latency. Um, and so, and so I suppose the, the piece was, Zach had written these tunes, and we deliberately hadn't shared the tunes. Um, so, we knew it was going to happen, and that the whole idea was to be, let's have a rehearsal. We'd never played together before either, so the point was to meet as musicians, learn some new tunes, um, so it was like it was supposed to be a real-time rehearsal, basically. Like a whole, the whole thing was new. 
Um, so it wasn't just the internet that we were testing. Um, so, so yeah, it was, it was sort of supposed to be a real-time learning experience for the three of us, and with the with the latent, with the low latency that may or not have been latent at all. Um, and when it started, it was it's, yeah, it was just me and the bass player, you and at the start. And I thought, I thought you sounded behind me. And I didn't know if that was I was pushing, if you were behind, if that was the latency <laughs> making you sound behind. No, I didn't know. It was fine because we never played together before either, so it was testing out the whole thing. Was we don't know each other. Maybe that's how you play. Maybe I was pushing. That's what I do anyway. Maybe there was latency. So all these things kind of happened. And then so we played together for three hours. And then over the three hours, gradually that stuff disappeared. And I don't know if we kind of accommodated to a latency or if it was if it wasn't in any way. We just got learned to play with each other better. Um, so but, you know, after the end of it, well, it was about two hours in, I think, wasn't it? we took a break uh, and came back, and it was suddenly very cool. I thought we were we were in together. We learned the songs a bit. We kind of figured out what each other was doing, like you do in a real rehearsal, you know, a normal rehearsal in a physical space. And it seemed to work really well. And the last sort of half hour or so, I was just playing the drums, and it seemed like it was all just cooking along. Um, the uh, the other piece of that was the, um, which I hadn't really thought about. There was I didn't have such a great. Um, Zach was not life size where I was. I had a, um, you might have seen from the shots, there was the drum kit, and in front of the drums is a, I don't know, it's a 15 inch TV uh, computer monitor. So I had the both of them on, the, on this monitor. And they looked fine, and it was all seemed okay. And then towards the end of the session, I think Paul said, let's see if you can break it. Let's, let's double the, uh, the, uh, the definition of the, of, the, uh, of the visual, which never occurred to me. And suddenly they brightened up, and there was a spectacular image. and everything seemed tighter, which was weird, because the sound didn't change. But for me, suddenly everything was like, ah, there we are, now we're in. And that probably shouldn't have happened, but it completely did happen. Um, and there was one other part of the experience that was really interesting for me, oh, I've just forgotten what it was. Do you have headphones on the roof? The headphones, thank you, that was the piece. The, um, yeah, I was talking earlier about like, the kind of, how I like to hear, you know, have my trousers flapping with the bass in the rehearsal, you know. Um, and that didn't happen, because everything was on the cans. And I, I definitely felt like we were like we were in the room, like it was really <coughs> like we were playing together. Um, and then, yeah, it was all on headphones. So taking the cans off, suddenly it was like that, and I'm back in London, you know, like Narnia coming out of the wardrobe. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> all right, get a cup of tea, come back, and then I had to kind of like put the headphones on and be like, okay, now we're back in in Edinburgh or not in Edinburgh, in somewhere in between, whatever, <laughs> in Lola. Um, but that was a bit weird, yeah. was kind of e exiting the physical space. And actually afterwards my ears hurt as well, because you know, if you wear cans for a while, then it's got to be a certain volume and it's just, you know. So that was unfortunate. Um, so I didn't, get the, I didn't get that sort of the physical thing that I was after from it. But I, I, in, in terms of the time, it felt, it was great. It actually felt, we said afterwards, didn't you know, we were writing furiously afterwards trying to capture the experience. It just felt like a real, it worked, it was not effective. I felt we were making music, we were just grooving. Um, and whether that was because I ju we just got used to it, and actually we were still sounding crap, I don't know, it, it felt better. <laughs> no, it did, we, we, worked, it just, we developed. Yeah. yeah. That's how it was for me. Thank you. So, uh, I'm going to talk about how it was for me, but as um, the saxophone player in the band, so the kind of the front line, the guy that's kind of taking the brunt of the melody, if you like, you know, taking the, the, the tune. But also as the guy who'd written most of the tunes, so I kind of had a, a bit of a best interest in it to work because it was my music and I wanted it to, to kind of sound the way I wanted it to and we'd spoken a bit about how we were playing in the room together but actually we still had this 450 mile difference between us. Well I was kind of scared about that, sorry to butt in, but that was what bothered me because we, we, we'd met, you know, we knew each other as academics and writers, but I'd never played with you and I was kind of like, oh my goodness, you know, this might destroy our relationship. <laughs> so I wanted to make the tune work. There's something in that about, you know, meeting in this different Way. Yeah, no, so, sorry. so true. No, and, and that's actually something that I, I want to talk about. So in terms of the, the, the way I'm going to think about the experience, I'm going to talk to you about what the music was. I'm going to talk to you a bit about the session and my feelings going into the session. Communication for me was one of the big things, and Gareth's already touched on that actually, but I'll reiterate as I go through. And then how was it as just a general kind of music experience for me? So in terms of music, first of all, we, we had these three tunes. So we decided, okay, we're going to we're going to use a, a, a bunch of different tunes that will do different things to us as musicians. So we kind of thought, do you know what, if all else fails and if the whole thing kind of goes arse up, then actually if we're playing something that we all know and we all know how to revert to kind of stereotypes and, and kind of just resort to tropes, then actually we might be able to, to kind of get through this. So we decided we would play a blues. This is a tune called Equinox by uh, Coltrane. 
This is the minor blues, very standard kind of 12 bar format, and we all know what we're doing, we've played them a million times, and you can just kind of hammer through it, can't you? you know, if, if you need to, you can make it sound how it needs. So we used it as our kind of warm up, and then we went on to these two more difficult tunes. There was this first tune called um, The Lion, looks different from here, the tune man. Um, and the point of it was it was actually supposed to be kind of saying, okay, if we can play the blues fine, what happens if we start changing time signatures? And what happens if we start using kind of harmony that doesn't really flow in the way we expect it to? It's a bit of a ballad, so we've got a bit of time to think about things, but nonetheless, not the easiest of kind of sight reads and it changes time signature and you've, you've got to play the, the kind of piano and the bass and all the one going, he's shaking his head like it's a broken <laughs> man. <laughs> sorry, to, sorry to bring it up, he's having a flashback. We should mention the click track as well in a minute. Ah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and then we went on to this tune, which isn't kind of necessarily harmonically based, it's about lots of different lines locking in with each other. So there is this bass part that kind of, that doesn't, actually look like a bass part if you look at it to be honest. <laughs> nice long flowing saxophone lines that kind of sit in between and then what Gareth described as a fucking <coughs> horrendous <laughs> drum group which <laughs> impresses me at one point. Uh, again just to, to kind of think like like what we're saying with Paul, like what happens if we try and break this? What happens if we push it one step further? What happens you know as musicians we know we can do this stuff, but actually what happens if we're separated by the distance? So this was the idea of choosing these these kind of different tunes. And on the whole, it kind of worked. The, the music that you heard kind of roughly sounded stuff like music, give or take. So the session for me was, um, I was really nervous, but I was also really excited at the same time because I was getting to do this thing. And as Gareth said, you know, we've been working on books and articles and papers and all these kind of things for ages together. And there was this thing about, what happens if I make an arse of it in front of this guy who I'm looking up to and learning all this stuff from? And actually, policy and you know, how it's horrendous, you know, all this kind of thing. But also, check this out, this was um, about a year before this, my uh, finger had a, a nasty bike accident, and this was kind of the first time I'd really played saxophone properly in, in a good few months, uh, well, kind of nine months, almost a year, really, so I was kind of really worried about the fact, like, does this thing push the fuck here, Did I just not get to play that note, that, you know? Also, you know, a student of mine, and you know, you kind of want to have your best chops out if you're playing with your students. And then a couple of students also who were helping us out, with Michael and Greg, that were helping us out with the, the recording side of things. But then the other thing was the, the cans, I first put it on. I got the cans on, and I was like, this sounds shit. This is, this is horrendous. It's all crackly and it's fuzzy and it kind of <laughs> like when you hear a police car going past, sort of thing. Actually, it turns out the headphones were broken. Because <laughs> I thought Paul's been telling me this thing's amazing and what happened? With it? Headphones were broken, changed the cable, and it was great. <laughs> I remained excited thereafter. So there was all these kind of things going around, like, the tunes out, right? is this going to work? Is this going to work? In fact, we're booked to go to a conference in three weeks' time in Denmark to talk about this stuff. It needs to work. So all these things were kind of buzzing around my head. When we actually got into it, communication for me was one of the most interesting things. And I was going to touch on this already. So we were in the studio, and this is the studio glass <coughs> looking into the into the kind of drum booth. And what we had was this wee camera here that was pointing at us, and that's what Gareth saw us through. If you look at what was going on in Gareth's room, we had him sitting at the drum kit in the middle of the room. This is the kind of monitor that he was describing here. We had his music stand for all these horrendous tunes that he'd never played before, sitting over here, and then the, the camera on top of the video monitor looking at him. So if he's sitting here and he's really looking at the dots and he's kind of making sure he's getting all these time changes, actually all we're seeing is your right ear, right. really, isn't it? Yeah. You know, so we've, we've not got that kind of line of sight thing. When we're improvising, when we're playing, we're saying, right, come on back to the top. You and I were fine because we were sitting three feet apart. But actually, Gareth was missing some of the cues. Not any fault of yours, but because the only line of communication oh, yeah, we exactly. had between us <laughs> was a video camera. Gareth <laughs> <laughs> missed all the cues. <laughs> <laughs> the only, you know, the only the line of communication actually wasn't necessarily where you yeah. needed to be at any given point. Like you said about the the, the kind of Skype thing, mm. you can't have this argument. As a result, if we were in a practice room together, we'd be kind of having a laugh and chucking drumsticks or saying jokes about your mum or, you know, <laughs> all, all these kind of things that musicians do when they're, when they're kind of playing together. 
but we didn't. And it felt, I don't know if you agree, but it felt really disciplined. It felt like we were all professional, taking turns to speak, exchanging yeah, in a kind of... Yeah, a different way. Yeah, more professional, more formal way than we might normally do. We think actually that's a huge plus. You might see on the face of it that that doesn't feel quite real, but it did make us behave. <laughs> you know? I felt angry. Yeah, so we were kind of exceptionally polite and we were cooperative and we were really trying to make this thing work because we knew the fact that there was a potential for it not to. So for me, it felt so usable for rehearsals. Great recording experience. Paul's going to talk about the fact that, yeah, there were these glitches, but actually we've got clever ways around that. It was a great recording experience enabled an otherwise tricky collaboration. We wouldn't have necessarily been able to just drop 200 quid to go down on the train to London to do it, or you know, just, just for the sake of playing together, that wouldn't necessarily have happened. Very few technical hitches, except for maybe that headphone thing at the start. And absolutely excellent results, I think, when, when the Pro Tools sessions are combined, and that's something that Paul's going to want to talk about more. So that's my cue. Okay. So, at the top of the, 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 the top there, it says, like any other session, a lot of it felt just like any recording session in the studio. It felt that, that the guys, like any, any studio session there, it took a wee bit of time for them to get into the feel of it. They were getting to know each other. I had to do what I would normally do, which is to kind of work on the cue mixes. And you heard Gareth describing the playing there initially with, with you and, and kind of feeling as though he was ahead. And at that point, I'm just thinking the timing doesn't feel quite right here these guys probably can't hear what they need. So either you need more bass or you need more drums or, or whatever, adjusting cue mixes. That would happen in any session there. So as we played around, the, the timing seemed, seemed to tighten up uh, as, as the cues uh, got better. And I think just as, as, the, as you started to play more with each other there. And we loosened up as well, didn't we? I think we just yeah, yeah, so exactly, you've all been in the studios, you know that you get into it, don't you? It, it, it adapts. So that didn't feel anything straight at all. I noticed uh, that there wasn't a lot of visual contact at first there, partly because this guy had written fiendishly difficult scores, and there was a lot of sight reading going on there. And the Ewan's there with sweat, kind of just trying to work out what he's doing with the part there. There wasn't a lot of time for you to be able to look up at the screen and, and, and look at what Gareth was doing there. But then again, that started to, to ease off, and we started to get a more kind of communication. At first there was a lot of communication between these guys and I thought well that's because they're next to each other in the studio and that feels natural and feels normal. There was less con uh, conversation going on between Edinburgh and, and London but then that started to change. Okay? So the big thing for me is that, is that last line there. You described me a couple of times as the producer in that session there and although I had a couple of assistants in, in in, in terms of, of Gregor and, and, and Andrew there, then I was the guy sat at the desk there, I was the actual engineer and I was the producer there. And that's not an unusual situation there. Once the, the tech is working, we say this, don't we? If you know how to use the equipment, you can then start to be the producer and listen to the performance there. You can listen, how good is that take? What's the timing like? What's the intonation like? And you can be thinking about, how is this progressing as a recording there? Was there a problem there? Do we need to, to do a drop-in? All that kind of stuff like that. So that was the role I was expecting to take. This is the first time we've tried it in a recording, in a recording situation there. And what I discovered was, because I could hear the glitches that you heard earlier on, as soon as there was a glitch, I stopped being a producer. I couldn't help it. I became an engineer. In fact, worse than that, I became an IT guy. Okay. Because I'm there looking at the screen going, hang on, hang on, we've had some packet loss. Check me out, packet loss, you know. Maybe there's a problem with the switch, all this kind of stuff. I, I was literally an IT engineer at that particular, that particular moment. And I couldn't have told you, if they, at the end of the take, if they'd said, how was that take? I would have just said, well, you kind of, you got there. I couldn't have said, as I would normally have said, well, actually, at bar 17, there was a bit of a problem there. I think there was an intonation, which there, was, there wasn't an intonation problem anywhere, of course. But yeah, you, you, you know what I'm saying there. I didn't have a clue because I was, I was going there. I think we've maybe got an internet connection there. There's, there's a problem there. Someone just checked their email and, I've, and I just kind of heard that glitch in the audio. So it absolutely showed me that we have to split those roles. There needed to be someone there who was acting as the producer and now I could have been left to just be the engineer and concentrate on, on the tech and the audio and those kind of things. But what was really fascinating for me was, 
it wasn't screwing these guys up. Most of the time, I don't know you if we bring you into this, a lot of the time we just weren't aware of, of kind of the glitches. It was only occasionally you went, what was going on? Because... Yeah, you put, well, by the time it's happened, it's come back in and you're already... Yeah, you, and playing kinda, game, so, you, you yeah. keep going. But there's definitely work to be done there in terms of, you know, did it affect the performance? In the studio, we're trying to get the best performance we possibly can. So, so was, was that an issue there? So, as we've said there, it felt very natural there. You said, you know, exceptionally polite. And that started to break down. You know, you started to slag each other a bit more and it felt very normal. Okay. I, in my session notes, as I was writing down there, you can see that I've said that by take three, this was starting to feel like a normal session there. Yeah, it was very natural. And 52 minutes in, I wrote in my notes there, chat is now three-way between all of them. Discussions were flowing naturally. And at 59 minutes, so it's an hour into the three-hour session there, I wrote down there, that take sounded usable. Okay? I could have said, that's the basis of the take. Now let's think about doing some patches. Let's do some drop-ins and whatever uh, to, to be able to sort things out. So from, from my perspective, yeah, it absolutely worked. Mm -hmm. Gareth made a mention there to change it, I mean, trying to break the system there. At one point, we switched across from 30 frames per second, so the picture is not being updated terribly quickly. So it's not exactly jerky, but you know how you get that thing on video whereby things don't look smooth and what have you, and the lip sync isn't quite right. When we change to 60 frames per second, then obviously we've got twice the amount of pictures. So the legacy goes down, the synchronization looks better, the image looks sharper, and that's what Gareth was, was commenting on. All of a sudden it became clearer, and what was really interesting was you kind of started to take, it became more relevant, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It became much more significant there. The downside of that is we're using twice the bandwidth, so we need an even better internet connection there. But we're trying out here things here that we know within five years we'll all be able to do. If you think about your internet connections at home, how they've in in increased the speed of them over the last couple of years, then we know that that problem is just going to go away. We're going to have the bandwidth to be able to do this. Um, and as I said there, a lot of the clicks that were kind of obvious to me um, didn't, it didn't seem to affect the playing. When I listen back to the recording, it's full of them. Yeah? So a lot of them go unnoticed and actually aren't a problem there. Yeah, you said you didn't notice them at all, and I didn't. I guess we were we were listening to different things. You were listening to time, and I was thinking about changes. It didn't interfere, you know. It was just it seemed to me it was playing well. Yeah. And hopefully, I'm, if I'm doing my job properly, I'm listening to quality. I'm listening for problems. Yeah. Trying to find out what's going on. But the good news about Gareth being at RCM, <coughs> he's got his proto session running there. We're up here, we've got ours running here. So even if there's little drops in the audio, it's not like you think, well, that's a whole session knackered, because that great bit had that clip in it. We can now conflate these two sessions, take the, the audio from yours, take the audio from ours. The performance has happened, it's now just a case of lining back up the files again, so we've got perfect flawless audio <coughs> from the session. It's just they're in two separate places and need to come together. So, the future. Can I mention the click track for that? Mm. Yeah. Of course, yes. Yeah, so we played with the click track as well. Um, which just for one song, for the last, was it yeah. for the last song? It's, it's, um, someone suggested, why don't we try it with a click just to see if that'll work, because then because the click is was started, the click was in London. How have you bounced back to Edinburgh? And then you know, so that was whether or not that would work, and it didn't matter at all. It was just like playing with the click. It was fine, but we thought that might add a kind of another layer of, or would it be? I don't know. Well, I'm not sure what, the, what was the kind of the technical potential issue there. Well, I, for, for me, it kind of ties in with the conversation I've had with, with Brian before about. There's a, I think there's p potentially a, a struggle that goes on at first. Someone's got to lead. And if, if that doesn't happen, then we get an interesting scenario. So imagine that you were actually playing there and Ewan was following you. And then you were waiting to hear him right, right, right. Okay. before you played. Mm -hmm. Then you've described this, Bryden, there. Almost things slow down because you're waiting for me <coughs> and I'm waiting for you. And it just kind of falls apart there. And over kind of greater latency, that's exactly what happens. So I suspect if we have a click, then that fight almost disappears. You know, who's leading here? Is it bass, is it drums? Who's kind of running that kind of tempo though? I think the problem goes because we just all know that the click is in charge. 
Yeah. So, so you're following the click. You're hearing it slightly later, but you're still following the click. So the result is going to be you maybe seem you maybe feel slightly late, but um, it's still going to kind of feel natural. So actually, people have been playing around with that for a while with longer latency. They've been using a click and they're putting they've been putting it in the middle. So if we're doing something between London and New York. <laughs> Click is on a boat in the middle of the Atlantic. <laughs> and everyone's kind of following that, because it's kind of halfway between in terms of latency. If you, you kind of see where, where, where we're going with that. So I think in terms of the future, what, what excites me is that companies like Avid that make Pro Tools, and no doubt all the other people that are, that are working on this kind of field, are trying to get us to use the cloud more. So everything is going, going, is going cloud-based. Now when we create a Pro Tools session there in the studio, it says, where do you want to store this? Do you want this on your local drive, or do you want it in the cloud? So what we're just starting to see now is that if it's cloud-based, I can open up and create a new session there, and the engineer down at the Royal College of Music with Gareth can open the same session that's in the cloud. So we can actually both be recording to the same place. So as Zach described there, at the end of the session there, we had glitches in the drum part, down at the Royal College of Music, they had glitches in the sax and the, uh, and the bass part there. We just had to dropbox the, the files to each other, swap them over, and we had the good drums and they had the good sax and the good bass there. But imagine in, in, in a year from now, if we're all recording to the cloud, then, and we've got fast connections, then by the time I hit stop, then the good audio has actually been downloaded to my machine. So when I hit play and we just say, listen back, let's see what that was like. I'm not listening to the temporary audio that these guys were playing to with your drums that might have clicks in it. I'm hearing to the pristine drum recording that was done down in London. So I think this is, this is quite exciting. And I think what excites me is, is kind of the potential carbon reduction, just knocking out all that travel, effective use of time. You know, imagine, as you said there, 200 quid, but also four hours on the train to come up for a rehearsal there. You're just not going to do the rehearsal, are you? You're going to, you're going to turn up the gig, gig at the gig and just go, well, we're going to wing this. Cool. Not with your writing. Wishes for the future? Uh, no. No. I think you've been doing enough and it's pretty fun. everybody going on. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So we, although Lola can work as a multi-track thing, then basically I was taking, I was sending a stereo mix so on one channel, I was sending bass, and on the other channel I was sending sax. So he just got a stereo feed down there. But in, in, in down in London, they were multi-miking the drums, so they had mics all over the kit there. They were doing a mix of the drums and sending a stereo mix up to, up to us. And what we were then doing is we made sure that each musician had a talk mat mic, so that if, Zach spoke, then that went down to London as part of the overall mix and the same thing with you in there. So, so we could communicate, we could hear what everyone else was, was, was saying there. If in the future I think we're doing that, then there's potential there to you to, as connections get faster, to be able to send all of the, the mics up from, from London there and we can have a mix there and we could be adjusting exactly what's going on in the same way that in the studio we get a personal monitor and we can, we can tweet what was going on. Essentially, we had a stereo mix going, going each way. Do you think in the future it would be possible to have a gig in more than one place at the same time? We're going to record an album like this and then launch it in different locations. I think that would be amazing. That's not Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, you, you think of the, of, the, of the things we've seen like, like Snoop Dogg at Coachella where we've got a virtual image. Well, there's absolutely no reason why we couldn't drop a virtual image of Gareth into into the Edinburgh Festival there and have a virtual drummer there. 
that's the trouble you start to to do yourself out of tra travel to cool places <laughs> So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I was going to ask if you combine this technology with virtual reality and have you know, multiple people in multiple locations all come down to uh, this one 3D space that's virtual, do you think that's possible in the future? I think that's exactly where we're going to go. I mean, it takes a while to render a virtual image, but you know, the computers are getting so fast these days that I think that's where we're going to end up, that, that people can collaborate over distance there. And if you think of that in terms of people that maybe can't travel, maybe that they've got an infirmity, maybe maybe it's an age thing, that, that there's no chance of them getting on a plane and flying somewhere. Imagine someone in a country where they've got visa restrictions and they just can't travel to that, you know, over to the to, to, to work with those other musicians there. So the potential for it just breaking down boundaries and, and, and open up that kind of creative potential I think is really quite exciting. Well, like sort of stream more than one person at a time because obviously you had you and the bass in the same room would it be like possible at the moment to maybe like stream the drums in one place and the bass in another and the saxophone in another or is that not going to work I think it will because we're about to, they're about to release Lola 2 it sounds like you're a plant in the audience there we've, we've never met <laughs> <laughs> this is not rehearsed I have nothing up my sleeve <laughs> Yeah, Lola 2 is just about to come out, and Lola 2, and because that's a, a, something we would love to be able to do, and Lola 2 essentially says, we, if we have Lola systems in three places, then, and the, for example, exactly that, if, if we introduced into the picture, and we, we put you over in Denmark, and we left you in, in the studio here, and we, we had you down in London there, then I that's it. You want to go to Denmark? Oh, I'm going to Denmark. You just said. Okay. <laughs> Notice you and ended up in Edinburgh. Wasn't given any chance, any chance of going anywhere else. So yes, absolutely. That. So the new system is going to be able to do that. Unfortunately, you need twice the bandwidth. We need a huge, you know, twice as fast internet connection there because the image of you in London is is going simultaneously to to two places. Yeah. There. But it's definitely going to happen there. And you're absolutely serious when you said that the next stage, these guys want to record an album. They enjoyed the experience and are now making me panic because they're saying that we want to do this for real. We want to actually record something there with, with researchers around, around the globe and see what we can do. I think there's potential for um, sort of from educational purposes as well. We're talking about maybe it'll be, um, well, we were talking earlier, weren't we? Mm -hmm. We both discussed as well the idea of. Um, Maybe when there are Skype lessons, maybe this is the way forward for that. It just makes things more immediate, real time, uh, disconnected kind of communities can be more brought together. And it's not it's not supposed to be entirely self indulgent making albums between three places because we can. I think there is there is a significant uh, implication for uh, democratizing access to music, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Imagine that dripping the ticking up a musician on Shetland and dropping them into a session, you know, a jam that's happening somewhere in Edinburgh or, or somewhere else in there. Wow. You know, it's just a fantastic thing. No, <laughs> you're right. You're right. Yeah. At the moment, they've got a, a wet piece of string, but, <laughs> but we're going to get there. Actually, actually, Shetland have got a gigabit connection, so so uh, it, it, it it will get there. It will get there. Maybe one more question. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
with uh, we did a master class to Italy and it was uh, a, a home player actually in Italy there and the actual home player who was teaching the class there was looking at the fingers there going to me it looked fine I'm not a home player and the, but the, the teacher was going there's something wrong here is there a bit of a delay that looks like there's a sync problem between the two so yet something we're working on and, and hopefully we're, we're going to be over, able to overcome that tech.